Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. And today's talk is all about coaching, consulting agencies. And I've got a fantastic guest for you, Nate Morse. And he's got a really interesting background in entrepreneurship. We're going to talk about the buyer's journey, sales, content creation, conversions. And um, I'm really excited to have entrepreneurs such as Nate on the show. So Nate, welcome. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, kind of introduce yourself to the audience and talk about how you got to do what you're doing. Yeah. So I have been building businesses since I was a little kid, um, probably like the first 20, you know, at least uh, failed and became nothing. Um, but it's good experience. Now, I went full time into actually running my own company when COVID hit. So in 2020. Now, before that, I was an entrepreneur for about six years which I would totally recommend doing that before becoming an entrepreneur if you can, but if not, still still go for the journey. Um, and so for the last four years, I've been helping coaches, consultants, and agencies um, use LinkedIn to get the highest value clients that they can get and how do we make it so that they enter the right conversation so they can actually become their client. Because I think that these people that are out there and especially like coaches where they're creating impact, um, the clients that you get basically decide what the business comes uh, becomes. And so entrepreneurs are the real like change makers of the world. So the clients that they have are super important. Um, so that's why, that's why we really focused on not just getting more clients, but better clients. And LinkedIn is the the platform that, uh, that we landed on um, being able to do that for ourselves and then for other people. Yeah. Go where your uh, clients and go where your buyers are. Um and uh, it's actually quite interesting, you know, LinkedIn is one of the, you know, it's kind of like one of those platforms where, you know, if you missed out on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok or Twitter, LinkedIn, you can still grow very quickly. So um, yeah, it's in those early stages right now, the content side of it. Yeah. Um, so LinkedIn is always changing in these, you know, it's really undergone an evolution. What's your, in your opinion, what are some of the most effective strategies for leveraging LinkedIn to drive sales, build relationships, build your network, and so on. Yeah. So now there's tons of there's tons of strategies. So I could like go forever. So I'll try not to um I'll try not to go too crazy. But yeah, first thing before you do anything, before you do your profile, um anything else is actually I would do some market research. And that's not even always um on LinkedIn. You can use Reddit, you can use you know Chat GPT to help you. There's um, tons of things. We even have a, a better client blueprint for this process. Um, but going through and finding like where the opportunities are they on LinkedIn, and then making it so that once we actually do things on LinkedIn, it's more aligned. So for example, making sure that your profile doesn't read as a resume, but something that actually allows people to connect with you and become leads at different stages in the buyer's journey. That's going to be the first part. And then doing outreach, making sure that you're constantly bringing in people who are in the market for what you offer right now into your connection base that they can see content. You guys can have conversations. Um, and so, you know, so it's kind of like there's a couple of schools of thoughts where you can see like some people are thinking that, you know, if you're going to do automation or whatever, then you're just going to go super spammy. Um, but it doesn't doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes it can actually just be a handshake that's starting the relationship and then content can carry it from there. Um, and then uh, next stage would be the content. So how do we make it so that the content is nurturing people and, and they're sharing it and it's progressing them through the buyer's journey? So that's, you know, kind of like, I guess on the back end, you have a actually a, a, a review and data process to making sure that you're um, you're increasing the results of everything. But that's kind of like the machine. I know you said like, what are some good strategies? Um, I tried to show the machine because what's really important is that we have deep strategy, um, not so much tactics. Um, a lot of you know people come and they're like, hey, like I was doing this and this and this and this, um, but they are not like connected or aligned, and it doesn't allow them to like use the platform as a mode of expression because they have these tactics all over the place. So um, yeah, I, I would I would rather not give strategies is like old tactics, but actually emphasize on having a more potent foundation and making sure that you're using all those elements of LinkedIn going from an actual place of, of yeah, deeper strategy. And that means that your expression of the ideas going outward and then the alignment of the, of the call to actions, um, 
you know, going inward so that that buyer can actually progress through the, uh, through the journey. So, um, that may not be the exact answer you wanted, uh, but that is the one that I think, uh, is needed. Yeah. Um, I love that. And you talked about a lot of uh, things that we can go down and dissect. And one thing is, um, talking about, trying to give you a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, the other thing is talking about is, um, you know, what's the most critical skill for a sales person to have in today's digital media landscape and why? Oh, a salesperson to have today? Um, yeah, that that's going to be, that's just going to be grit, honestly. Even entrepreneurs, like you look at um, like uh, Sam Altman, right? With, uh, with OpenAI, he just put out something like a, a month or two ago, I saw. And he basically said that in all the companies that they invest in, even if they look good on paper, if they can't handle the hard times that life likes to throw at entrepreneurs, they're not going to survive it. And so I think that a salesperson is, you know, they're, they're like, they're almost like an entrepreneur in terms of they do a lot of the same like growth minded stuff. And they're, they're, they're in that one specific area. And, you know, I've been in sales roles before I was an entrepreneur for, you know, over 10 years. And so like those, um, you know, those like stages are very similar. And yeah, I think that came down to grit as well. If I looked at like who did well and who didn't along the way, it was the people that when things got hard, they started to let that decide what's going to happen versus how are they going to control it. And it seems like some people can do it for X amount of time until um they start going. And then other people have a fuel that burns, um you know, through those times. Yeah, I've been, I've been. So a lot of people just aren't built for it. I think is what I'm realizing at this point. Like, because you can basically figure out, okay, who has it and who doesn't, and then it's pretty much those are always going to be just like that. I'm, I am yet to see someone go from a completely fixed mindset to a growth mindset. Um, I've, if if anyone's met anyone that has actually made that switch, that's legitimate. I would be interested um, to know, but I, I have yet to see that in someone, unfortunately. <laughs> Kind of got a little bit jaded, I guess, on it. Who knows? But yeah, I've been uh, talking to a lot of entrepreneurs, such as yourself, and um, you know, um, what's interesting is uh, they said, especially you know, COVID, and it's we're still recovering from it. We're almost out, but um, you know, almost four years. And they said that if you made it out, just basically, entrepreneur is like you just have to out survive. It's not an out. It's basically cost cutting and cost reduction to get through the bit to have adequate runway. And, um, yeah, so I mean, that's just like, any, that's just like even, but that's just the, yeah, that's the financial side, um, as well. But like, let's say, I don't know, do you do any, uh, you do any, what you got any hobbies? Yeah. I, yeah. I have, yeah. A lot of hobbies. Yeah. Give me, give me any of them that are closely sports related. If you have any sports ones, those are ideal. I mean, running marathons, that's, you know, that's, I mean, that's probably, you know, quintessential example. Okay. Yeah. So let's take this because I think sports and, and the entrepreneurial journey are both um, personal development related. So I think they're very similar. Now, if you're, if you're running uh, marathons, right, the people like, let's say that you start your first year, right? You start your first year, your first marathon with everyone else that also wants to do marathons that year, right? How many of them do you think continue to do that the second year from that group? What percentage would you say? Uh, I mean, I would I would just be guessing, but I'm you know probably uh, I, the most of the people that I know that run marathons they uh, they continue it, but uh, yeah, I'm talking about those specific beginning stages because that's where people decide if they're going to stay or not, right? So that first three years of of them like you know doing marathons like that, that's probably going to be like when you're going to have the highest drop off, you know. So a lot of the surviving is also just like people go, ah, oh, this is hard, you know? And like that they in their head, if it's too hard, then they decide to, if it's a degree of hard that feels a certain, you know, threshold, then, uh, then they think that it's a uh, time to quit, I guess. So, um, yeah, I just, I see that in, uh, in almost everything is you see like people, people drop off as time goes on. Yeah. Um, kind of the next question I have is, but yes, um, for the financial side, yes, that would be, that's going to be the main, like tangible, uh, thing that they experienced for sure. Cause other businesses weren't built to survive through that and they have to adjust, you know, and a lot of people are building their business during this. And so they're going to be in a way better position. Potentially they have a, they don't have to rebuild like the other guys do. 
Yeah, the next question I had was um you you talked about what is needed in today's buyers in the online marketplace and what is that? Yeah, so when you let's take a example of when people are going to buy a, a car or a house or anything big ticket. Cuz I work with those companies a lot on this. And if you notice, let's say you're going to go shop for a car and you actually can't become a lead until you pick out which unit you want, right? But when I was a car salesman when I was younger, almost everyone that would get on the lot, I would take down all their wants and needs and information, right? So I'm able to help them out at an earlier stage in the buyer's journey. Um, but a lot of people, because the way that marketing goes is the market sophisticates. And for, so first everyone says like, hey, like I'm here, I exist, right? And then someone else shows up and says, hey, I'm better than that guy. And then someone else shows up and says, hey, I'm doing it a different way than those two guys, right? So that's like how the market kind of sophisticates, right? And so- we're still in the early ages of the internet. And so I think that the market is in a mindset of showing that we exist is like all that they, all that they need. They think that's the first step. Um, but we need to actually show people not only do we exist as a resume, but that we actually have ways to connect with you at different stages in the buyer's journey to help you even make the decision to, um, to work with them or something. Does that make sense? So so a lot of people are just focusing on that, on on the people who are ready to buy. And they're like, you know, that's that's like 3% of the market. You know, so you're going to pass up on the majority of opportunities if we're just focusing on um, on basically being like a resume and kind of ignoring the buyer's journey. Yeah, great insights. And the next question I have is um, when you're talking about um, how do you see the future of sales changing with it? advancements in technology and AI, how should sales professionals do to stay relevant and competitive? Yeah. So, I mean, for salespeople, I think that they should, there's a bunch of different cool AI things. Um, you know, obviously you have ChatGPT, so you can throw things in there and, and see different responses of how you could reply to someone. And that'll just get you out of having to create the response on your own. It's actually easier to judge something and create your own relative to it versus create something from scratch. So that would make it uh, much more efficient than the other people um, that aren't doing that. And then, yeah, different tools and and automations and things that, uh, especially LinkedIn, you know, things that help, um, you know, make that buyer's journey better. That helps people, uh, you know, sell or like be pre-sold. Um, and then I'd also say there's a lot of tools for like market research to find where the opportunities are. And the number one reason that businesses fail is lack of market research. So you could like be on the right platforms. You could be talking to the right people. You could be sending all the right number of messages and stuff, you know, but if it's not actually good by their standards, then that's not going to work. And so it doesn't matter what, what platform you go to if you don't have that figured out. So AI and, and technology will make, um, you know, all of that, all that a lot easier. It's more really AI at this point is more of like a workflow enhancer than, um, you know, the actual original, uh, you know, creator. That's fascinating that you, how you talk, um, how AI's, um, evolved and now it's, now it's kind of like, can be like more of an assistant and later on with generative AI is going to be, yeah. um, well, do you remember? Uh, do you remember? Because uh, you're obviously familiar with ChatGPT. Are you Are you familiar with um, with Jasper? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jasper. Okay. Yeah, so Jasper was called Jarvis earlier, and uh, they brought me in. I was the second person to use it in like a really small group of people. So way before ChatGPT was out, you know, I had already had a year in, um, you know, using Jarvis back then. So uh, yeah, the next question is um, LinkedIn provides various features and tools like Sales Navigator and how can sales professionals make the best use of these tools to improve their sales efforts? Yeah, so I mean, definitely use Sales Navigator because it lets you do more on LinkedIn. Um, and it lets you, yeah, it gives you much more filters and you can save lists so then you can keep track of different buckets of people that you want to talk to. Um, so yeah, Sales Navigator, Sales Navigator is great. You also get some, uh, you get to message more. Or you get to have like more connection requests and more messages if you have it. Um, now, in terms of uh, other tools, I think salespeople should be using. I think that they should be because personal brands are becoming bigger, and so I think that people should be using um, the creator mode, so that they can 
not only create just normal posts, but now you can do live videos, you can do articles. Like those are things that um, are longer form content. And while everybody else is messing around with short form content, that's not that deep. You can actually have stuff that's deeper that people will want to consume. And then they'll be, and then they have a bigger change or transformation like in their head so that you become a higher degree of a thought leader. Right. And then now your resources are going to go back to, because if you have a bunch of short form, it's not super valuable. It's just like top level um, engaging. You know, it's it, it's hard for someone to want to go back to that to get like a real deep impact in in what you do. And kind of as we end this talk, I really enjoyed this talk. And um, you know, LinkedIn's been a critical platform for B two B sales. And how can a sales professional optimize their LinkedIn? Perf- profile to attract more quality leads and prospective clients. Yeah, perfect. So that goes back to what I was saying a little bit earlier about not only being a resume, like for example, um, you know, obviously you want to have nice photos, you want to have a a banner that is nice and, you know, tells people what you do. Um, But little things like the bio line, like a lot of people will just put, you know, I'm this and I help these people. But it's like, that's not engaging. It's not engaging. No one's going to, that's, there's no call to action there. Right. So it's like, again, it's that just saying that we exist versus creating something that's engaging. If you want to be in the buyer's journey, we want to, you know, actually engage with people who are in those stages. So, I mean, that's just the, that's just the bio, you know, the, the story or the about section is a great place to put like a personal story and, and show how you progressed and came to this position that you're in. Um, also one, one hack that I like to show is the, the uh, uh, experience area. A lot of people just put in one position but if you think about it, LinkedIn is is like a search engine where people are looking for roles and, and topics. And also you you index on Google, which doesn't really happen with other social media platforms. So articles, things you write, that'll they'll just boost it even more. Um, but in that experience section, if you if you go connect to me on LinkedIn, you find me and you look on there in that section, you'll see that uh, there are actually uh, multiple experiences in there because they're going to be looking for different things. So now with I can have one profile but it might show up for like six different titles, you know? So there's different things like that where you can kind of get more, um, get more reach because especially if you're like a coach or, or a business owner, like there's a lot of roles and a lot of different ways that people are going to go through the buyer's journey to, you know, find someone like you. Yeah. So well said, and uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. How can people find out more about you and find out about the work that you do? Yeah, totally. So you can go to my website, obviously connect with me on LinkedIn, but you can go to my website as well, natemorse.com. I put articles on there. Um, there's resources and things on there and different programs, and you can book a call with me uh, if you need more help. Also, I have a book on Amazon called um, The LinkedIn High Ticket Handbook. It's also, um, you can get it for free on my site if you want to get it on there. It'll give you a PDF. If you want to get the uh, physical version, um, go to Amazon and and, uh, and get there. But yeah, hopefully we'll uh, connect on LinkedIn. Um, shoot me a message if you saw uh, this podcast. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. Yeah. And for all the audience out there listening, Nate, for coming on, um, like I love LinkedIn too. And um, it's really great for networking, marketing, and uh, you know, really, really valuable tips during the conversation and check out his website and Socials, give them a like. N-A-T-E-M-O-R-S-E.com in case anyone tries to go (laughs) M-O-R-I-S. Yeah. Um, And uh, all all the resources will be in the links and show notes. And thanks so much for coming on. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me.